Knightley Shared Academics, as uh, many of you know, is a part of the National Institute of Technology uh, in Liberal Education. And we are hosted at Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. And I am Georgian Hewitt, welcoming you today from Evanston, Illinois. Knightley Shared Academics is designed so that faculty, staff, and administrators who work at member institutions can come together to explore, examine, and evaluate ways to enhance teaching and scholarship through the integration of inquiry, um, pedagogy, and technology. And this venue is one in which Knightley Network members, such as yourselves, uh, can connect with others who have shared interests, facilitating the exchange of knowledge and identifying potential ways in which we can collaborate to advance our missions. Um, on the post-seminar survey today, we're going to provide a place for you to identify any topics on which you are looking for co-collaborators. We're finding these days that a lot of people want to work with uh, colleagues at other institutions. And so if you'll just help us know what you're interested in, uh, that can help us facilitate uh, introductions. We uh, encourage, as many of you know, uh, you all to attend these events either as individuals or in groups, and uh, we provide discussion guides for you to start conversations on your campus, and uh, we encourage you to use the resources from the seminar with colleagues who might be interested in the topic. I mentioned the recording earlier. You certainly are welcome to share that with your colleagues on your campus. Here are some upcoming seminars, and uh, we welcome you to register for any of these, or you can um, uh, encourage your colleagues across campus that you know would be interested in one of these particular topics uh, to register for them. Just go to the Nightly uh, website and click on Shared Academics, and you can find details about any of the upcoming seminars. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have two more that I should be adding within the next week uh, for May. And we welcome you to suggest seminar leaders and topics uh, that are important to you and your institution. So uh, please take time to do that. Um, really, you can do that anytime, both on today's survey or you can email me at uh, any point in time. Uh, a great way to keep up with what we are doing is to subscribe to the Nightly News and stay connected with us on uh, social media. Uh, today, if you're using Twitter, you're, uh, we encourage you to use the hashtag Nightly. Um, because that allows us to keep track of the conversation. So um, I want to go ahead and introduce today's uh, seminar leaders. Um, Benjamin Benny Bollock is Associate Professor of Economics at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. He specializes in history, methodology, and the rhetoric of economics and in comparative economic systems and cultures. He's presented at numerous conferences, published several journal articles and book chapters. He's written a book on the rhetoric of economics and taught a wide variety of interdisciplinary and economics courses. He spent more than nine years experimenting with technologically enhanced pedagogy to breathe life into the teaching of economics and to place it in its historical perspective. And joining Benny today is Connor Neve, a double major in math and economics at Rollins College. So Benny and Connor, welcome, and thank you for presenting for Nightly Shared Academics. Benny, um, I'm gonna make you the presenter, and I'm going to mute my mic so we don't get any feedback, um, and let you get started. Alrighty. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see. So it looks like we're on. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'll just, you know, jump right in and, and hope to get questions. And I want to say, first of all, that uh, please contact me with questions, follow up. We got so much we could share. Um, collaboration, everything would be wonderful. All goes well. You see uh, my tricky slides um, large on your screen. And I believe you have control yourself too. Um, well, a little Confucius, thanks to Connor, who we will, you, will, you will see a little bit later on for that quote. Um, but let's just start right away. So I'll start with the fact that I've been doing um, 10 years um, using computer games in classes, which is one of the aspects of gamification. We'll, we'll, we'll delineate that a little bit later. But um, stage one is actually using video games in the classroom. Uh, a little bit of a brief background as relevant here. One is that I'm first generation gamer. I'm 48, just turned recently, um, and started playing Star Trek on an IBM 360 mainframe computer back in the days when the, what, the 
the ships were made of wood and the men of iron. Um, the second stage would be in Unity Chapel Hill in graduate school, uh, fell in love with teaching um, and discovered educational technology. And I'm starting to mess with the web in the 90s as a repository or base for the class, uh, just as Blackboard was coming up and all that stuff. I started not liking it already back then. Um, now, learning economics and find, getting interested in teaching economics and getting experience doing it, um, the, it was, a, was a, a double-edged sword in the sense that economic education is really the worst of the worst um, in so many ways. Because certainly the undergrad and, and even graduate level, this is not besmirching Chapel Hill, quite frankly, maybe they, they were smart enough and honest enough to, to expose that for me. But it's really a paradigm of bad underground, underground teaching overall. It's irrelevant, it's doctrinaire, it's boring, and it's anti-experiential. Um, now, there, in the economic context, there are a couple of solutions. Um, first of all, at the content level, you have history of thought, um, which is an important way to contextualize these ideas, um, turning it into a social science and not a faith. Um, there's methodological pluralism, there's introduction to heterodox approaches, um, a host of things uh, in this domain, which isn't really um, in our topic here. Then there's form. Um, so uh, this is teaching experiments, something that was very important inspiration for me, uh, using um, experimental kind of psychological methods, uh, but to teach, not necessarily to research people's behaviors. And we'll talk about some of that aspect. Um, later on, uh, using me media of different kinds, even role playing, a lot of uh, different interesting ways, many of which I did learn in Carolina from my teachers and, and the other TAs and so on. But I finally did my homework, as it were, at Wallace, coming to here and uh, devoting uh, to the and teaching um, based uh, institutions such as we are. So I started doing those homework. Um, thanks to uh, my colleague Ken Taylor, who could be in somewhere in the room with Jonathan. Uh, in many ways, I was introduced to Benjamin Bloom. And one of the key insights that, that happened to me was to realize that, I, that it was familiar, but it wasn't familiar from the classroom. Neither my own classroom, classrooms I sat in, or my kids' classroom. Um, but it was familiar from the gaming industry. I found that a lot of the things that I was reading in pedagogy were employed really in the gaming industry and not in the classroom. Um, so that led further to looking at, uh, at learning by play. And that, of course, uh, when you stop for a moment, you realize that it's extremely fundamental. Animals learn like that, right? The baby, the baby tiger, the baby lion doesn't start with antelope because it'll get killed. Starts by jumping on its mother's tail. So in the theology and anthropology and psychology, we seem to know this, but we don't really employ it in the classroom. Um, we also admire teaching methods that are essentially games. The Socratic Helen course is a mind game, isn't it? Debate is a social mind game of some kind. Um, and I really started questioning this hierarchical opposition, which may be a Victorian, I'm not sure, you don't help me out, uh, but the serious work um, as opposed to frivolous play as a seriously problematic aspect here, yeah, that's debilitating for us. Um, so kind of jumping to the practicality, to the applied um, um, on this side. Uh, one of the questions that always comes up is educational versus commercial gain. And uh, I'm all for commercial gain. Um, now, first of all, is the key to understand uh, this, I think, is that the fun is the learning, you know? not a slogan. You know? The fun is the learning itself. It's not that we have uh, what was in the 90s, the edutainment, that we present uh, traditional material, but in a fun and graphic way with a little bunny rabbit on the side that, that, that has, does a little animation. This didn't work um, because it's not it, right? It's the process of learning itself, which is the core of any game. From Angry Birds, as you try your different angles to, to, to blow up the buildings to the most sophisticated strategy games. Um, the fun is in the learning. Um, a good, another good example of, of getting this is um, I used with a game that I was observing on my kids. I've used my kids myself and then kids in school as a guinea pig a little bit. And it's a zoo tycoon. Essentially, you run your own school and you, use, you put animals inside and you treat them nicely. They thrive and have babies. So this kind of highlights to me two different views. An encyclopedic view, it harkens back to the 18th century really, and sim versus simulation. Right, so so in encyclopedic view, you you want to learn about lions. You have this sheet of paper, right, in an encyclopedia or a screen. It can you can spice up the graphics. That's not the essence of the issue. And you have uh, here's the lion. This is how it looks like. This is how it looks as the baby. This is where it lives. This is what it eats, etc., etc. You go through that. 
and you absorb what you absorb. But in a simulation such as Zoo Tycoon, you observe the kid experimenting, right? They have to put the light, treat the lion well, they have to put him in. If they put him in a swamp, it doesn't thrive. If they, it doesn't have enough food of the right kind, it doesn't eat, and therefore doesn't have babies. And the kid, all they want is to see the cute little baby cubs really come up on the screen. But in the process, and within context, they learn all of these things that are on that encyclopedic sheet, but in a, in a different, um, active way. Um, next we have, uh, the idea that is uh, by one of the most important people in this uh, this domain, um, oh, I can see what's going on here, okay, mess up your screen, is J James Paul G, one of the what the, the fathers of the gamification, and he makes the the commentary that a textbook that we still use um, a lot in classes is really a little bit like a game manual without the game, um, which which is a pretty sad affair, really. Finally, about commercial games. It's hard to compete with this giant industry. It's important to stress. It's a bit of an elephant in the room, this whole game phenomenon and influence. It's approaching a $100 billion industry, and that's bigger than any other form of entertainment of any kind. Not combined yet, but it might get there soon. Um, there are plenty of great games. I have a long wish list we don't have time to, to, to do now, but I, I can't say one. It's a, it's, a, it's a massive virtual world, which is the human body. In which you take uh, different roles of, say, immune cells, for example. Um, I can guarantee you that this would be a great success, and anybody in the industry may be listening, and the kids will come out of it, and grow up, will come out of it with, with amazing biological knowledge. Um, that's my pet um, initially. Um, now, it's important to mention here, and we'll get back to it in more detail, that gamification, unlike possibly other forms of technology in education, is not labor replacing. Teachers are absolutely needed. And maybe even especially in commercial games as opposed to educational games designed to teach you so that all the teaching is kind of coded into the game. Um, technically, yeah, you buy the disc and you don't need the professor. But when you use commercial games, the debriefing um, and the support guidance is quite critical. And which commercial game? So uh, those links are in the link list. And I'm always happy, like I said, to share. And there's just representative. There's a lot of work on it. Civilization is the most sophisticated, turn-based, the, the chess, if you will, of the video computer industry. I started using it in the classroom here with Rollins in version 3. We're now at version 5 with two expansions. And it's a remarkably sophisticated game. It's very difficult to describe a game. Um, no, maybe just visually sometimes I could, I could spend a minute here and just show you how it looks and it could be intimidating, but, but consider that there are 200 discrete concepts or more, hard to count them really, and all with multiple interconnections between them. It's an extremely complex game, but it's a very mature game in the sense that, um, and I'm used to it with students that I tell them to just, just jump in, make wise decisions, the game guides you gently through the process so that uh, you don't have to be a hardcore gamer to jump in. And I have had now 10 years' experience with kids who've never played video games, or certainly not of this kind, who uh, surprisingly take to them very well. It's, it's very, um, the learning curve is, uh, is uh, highly tuned um, so that you learn by play. And the different levels of challenge that you can set up. So if you start at the beginner level, it, it just rolls on. And 20 hours later, you, you wonder what you how quickly the time flies. Now, a lot of groundbreaking work was done by Kurt Squire on this, and he deserves, uh, at least in my exploration, of this uh, much credit, and all the way with many others to the very last things I've been reading about this, specifically at Nightly, and that would be uh, the, the, the issue of transformation uh, that we just mentioned, especially for Brian Bennett Webb's article, and that web article is on the website, and you see it here, and it's also um, um, now, another family, complete other family of games that I've experimented with explicitly are MMORPGs, right? Massive multiplayer online role-playing games, most famously World of Warcraft, also known as Geek Crack, uh, because of all the horror stories about people who did a job with their family and their lives um, to, to go over into the virtual world. Now, there's some very interesting uh, initiatives going on that have been going on since at least that I'm aware of, uh, at least six, seven years in the world of Warcraft. Uh, there's the WoW in school. It's mostly high school, but it's a very interesting initiative, a wiki with a lot of interesting information. 
And I want to point out that one of the most amazing applications of these um, virtual worlds is for foreign language. And it's been studied rather well, and there's an example that I give here, but there's a lot of others. The idea here is that you can actually get fake immersion. One of the main problems of teaching people, meeting them for an hour and 15 minutes twice a week, it's really almost impossible to teach a language properly. We all know you have to go abroad and preferably fall in love with somebody who doesn't speak English. Uh, but, um, well, you can do it. You can have kids go into the World of Warcraft, spend a lot of time meaningfully interacting with people in a foreign language. Uh, so it's really as close to immersion as you can get. Um, in many, some cases, even probably more, given that so many people around the world do speak English. Um, and it has been tried to, so it's quite an interesting way of doing things. Um, now, where have I used these courses? Um, well, first of all, in the process of adopting uh, this kind of thing, uh, one of the first things is the ability to, to try it in some kind of elective. Um, and that's what I did. Economic history elective was the first time exactly for me to go out, that book. And that allowed me some freedom to experiment. It was kind of a broad elective, so I didn't have any specific material. It wasn't core curriculum that other teachers may, may depend on the material I deliver or anything like that. And it's important to allow yourself the freedom because there's so many unintended consequences. Inevitable. Ever since, I've been teaching a lot of our economic and historical perspectives using SIV specifically. And um, I just, just to mention that we do have a very special curriculum. Uh, that's kind of why I came here. Um, I like to think why they hired me, <laughs> um, and that is we start with history, and that's the course I, I kind of focus on here, empirical, this economic and historical perspective. And then we teach the traditional, we teach what we call Micmac, uh, the theoretical standard neoclassical uh, course to some extent, so it's by then not so standard since the kids know the kids know complicated uh, economic history at that point. They have something in context to to place the neoclassical theory in, and then uh, the ever complicated uh, alternative perspective in which a different kind of methodological approach is actually. So that's kind of our core principle cycle, which is different than most schools. And I also taught using World of Warcraft this time to our freshman seminar. Um, oh, I see that my star, my comment, uh, is it doesn't show in the slide. That's okay, because I call the course Deus Ex Machina, Social Evolution in Virtual World, and I like to think it's the most Name for a course ever done. Uh, so, you know, uh, it is very complex, but hopefully with humor. Um, what do we actually do? Now, there is a document, uh, do we have it somewhere? Or if not, it'll be in the package uh, of a general comparative analysis with all the details. It's a kind of two page document with it you can browse. But essentially, what we do is a comparative analysis between the simulation uh, itself, the process is now done in the game, in the game world, and the real world. Uh, that we learn from history, reading, um, uh, cartoons, media, videos, um, etc. So they have to um, compare. Now, first of all, I want to kind of, by the way here, yeah, that this is a little bit what's going on in in highly quantitative promising. If uh, um, complexity, what they do in the Santa Fe um, uh, Institute in New Mexico, basically the difference between simulation methodology and model methodology, which is much more sadly, I believe, mean, typical in economics. All right, that's exactly what we do. We look, we, we set up a simulation, we see what happens in the simulation, and then we compare it to the data. So that's how we found the Anasazi Indians. Were, what, what happened, why did they disappear? Because they ran out of water. That's kind of how it was discovered. Um, so, so there's an interesting parallel between using video games in the classroom and what they do in the very top uh, echelons of academia uh, in the quantitative realm. And we'll get maybe mention that again later. Um, and we do some variations on this too. So we experiment with different things, such as write instead of just writing an analytical um, uh, parallel, maybe writing it in epic prose. You know, it sounds like uh, you know Homer uh, when you're describing your ancient walls. Uh, which is kind of cool and role-playing, and uh, possibly, again, get more, more um, individualization to it. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of group work where people can help each other and foster discussion, and on that, too, um, it will come up again, and especially when we go to the second part after um, and Connor presents um, his stuff on the, on the gamification of the course itself. Um, we'll get there very shortly. So the general results from using the video games, again, mostly still and to some extent uh, with Warcraft, is first of all, broad enthusiasm for history. Say no more, right? The most hated, I think, topic, uh, even more than that, in, uh, uh, in high school, certainly, we do have data on that. I'm not entirely sure about college, but not something typically people get 
be excited about, sadly. Um, so another thing um, is reaching upper cognitive level, um, a, a la bloom. And I'll flash a picture at you in a moment, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. So it's very difficult in traditional ways to get up there to creation and evaluation and uh, get beyond the knowledge. Uh, and I think that in the game, basically the game forced you to go through the entire level, all the way up the pyramid and down again and up again, every turn of the game, really. Otherwise, well, you're going to lose. So, so it really fosters that. Um, then there's higher attention. And here is something that really, I have to do some work to measure it, but it's a challenge for us in economics in particular, and I'm sure in many other places too, to retain knowledge between courses so that, you know, you take the second course in the cycle and students all deny having ever heard of the, the material that was presented in course number one. It might be that they're strategizing and very clever. I think that's much of what's going on. But I'm hoping that some of this actually increases retention along the lines suggested by Dale back in the late 60s, um, that, that the more experiential involved learning uh, is also leads to more retention of the material. Um, but essentially what's going on is that the students experience the economic concepts, um, just like my example with the zoo type group. Yeah? So it's personal, it's ownership, you care about it, it's your people, your unit, your city. It's meaningful in the sense that you're making decisions based on concepts that in this case economic, social science, but, uh, but they are your, your, your personal experience is determined by how well uh, that happens. So one of the examples in economics, we do consumption versus investment, right? Do you eat it all now or do you save some so as to eat more later? Um, this can be a pretty nibble of term that isn't presented in a textbook, but in the game it happens all the time. So you build a, a, a granary now, it's very expensive, or, or, a, or a scout to go look for treasure. If you build a granary now, the scout will be easier to build after the granary is built. The food surplus will be enhanced. So these things just come naturally to the kids, and uh, then they read Jared Diamond, get some further information and, and analysis about it. But again, personal and meaningful um, reification. Um, and finally, systemic and strategic sophistication at levels that typically are very hard to get anywhere else, as far as I see and as far as students are meant to. Uh, so here's a picture of Bloom. I'm not going to read a picture, right? And here's a picture of um, Edgar Dale's Cone of Learning. Um, um, there are some downsides, obviously, like everything else, right? The main thing that comes with the CIV and economics is that it's hard to push the students from the virtual world, from discussing their simulated world, to, the, to compare it to the real world, different semantic space. Um, so I put to you that, well, a lot of guidance and pushing them and specific assignments lead them to do it, you force them. Uh, but even those who refuse to some extent or who don't take that part so seriously are engaged in very sophisticated scenic thought. Um, and that's already, I, I think, it's, a, it's an important stage, even if they're not that familiar with the real world economic facts because they haven't really delved into making the comparisons. They still have thought at high levels about their gaming world, and that's pretty good. Um, but let's, let's stress that there's absolute need for good debriefing. I would think, first of all, like any experiential learning, just like my colleagues would take students to, to a food, uh, to do, to a food, um, uh, kitchen and, and uh, find that if they don't do the proper, um, um, debriefing, the students actually come back with their, uh, stereotypes of poor people, uh, in fact, reinforced. Uh, so debriefing is critical here and gamification still requires the teacher to do that. Um, just as much. Really. Um, maybe that is why there's so much of uh, the tradi well, traditional, I don't know if that's the right word, but the typical distance learning is so awful uh, because this is not being done, debriefing, the first of engagement by the teacher. And I think this is a potential where gamification has a strong potential to improve significantly on electronic uh, delivered teaching for the good old solid pedagogical, age-old even, uh, reason that we need a good teacher. Um, finally, what to do next? Uh, well, I'm going to, this time I'm going to try uh, doing this much more intensively in class, trying to look at the social epiphenomenon that developed in multiplayer gaming of discussion, banter, uh, live exchange of between people in the room while they also interact uh, mediated by media. And that's an interesting phenomenon that anybody who's played multiplayer games knows and fondly. Uh, so let's see how that translates into the classroom. And I have a perfectly a low level course over the summer to do that in. 
I'd like to try other games, um, especially virtual worlds, uh, the massive online game, maybe a social laboratories, maybe look at behavioral economics, um, that again, Con will mention in a moment, uh, do finance in auction houses in the world of Warcraft, a lot of interesting approaches. And finally, at the higher level, perhaps really look at um, these um, gaming environments and those professional simulations, such as, and I give the link here, NetLogo, which is a professional platform for doing science with simulations. I think that might be a very good approach. And here I stop for a moment to take a breather. Uh, and um, and do a poll, right? And do I give, uh, ah, no, nope, I don't need to give control. There it is, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's a little suspicious perhaps, but no, this one isn't suspicious, the other one. So hopefully you see that, and you can give us uh, kind of just a, a little feel of that, and I will just trudge, trudge I think, right along, yes, very shortly, aha, uh -huh. yes, almost. The second branch of gamification, uh, the separate branch of gamification, is gamifying the entire course. So it's distinct, surely related, but distinct from using a video game in a traditional course, again, in my case, in a very teaching-oriented liberal arts um, college. So I've been working on this since the summer. So this will be the third iteration of Splitters. Right? And once again, here too, there's a lot of the stuff that is familiar. The good pedagogy translates into this. It's nothing really new. New delivery method of old, solid pedagogy. Uh, and I have syllabi for this, but I think also it's going to be in the package. But I uh, started with economics, media, and propaganda, which is a low level elective for economics, critical media studies, American studies, oh, what else? Uh, oh, recently women's studies. Um, so it's a kind of a broad course, uh, and then the fall, a full semester version of that, and then uh, my pompously named uh, freshman seminar, uh, using World of Warcraft in the classroom too, so using games. But the core here we're focusing on is that the entire class is that structured, and I'll, I'll show it to you visually shortly after the spreadsheet, um, just so you can look at it. Uh, and then right now we're doing Economic and Historical Perspective, the course that I used to in, and, but it's also entirely game of thought. Uh, what exactly that is, we'll see in a moment. And a, a third generation of this course, I think we're finally getting it, and now it's blended learning, so less contact time. Quite frankly, I myself am a little torn about it. Um, I, I Usually I do all this stuff, but I still maintain all the class meetings. Here we only uh, meet 60, I think I ended up about two-thirds of the time, um, and that's an interesting development. What extent can we use this to, to compensate for meaningful personal interaction with the teacher uh, to some extent. And senior seminar, which is, uh, again, here no video game because it's a research-based capstone course, but um, just the curriculum is structured a little bit differently and is delivered in a gamified learning management. And it's definitely going to be continued. Um, got a lot to do. Uh -huh. Uh, some, well, that's a, that's a, that's a non-committed option to the phone. <laughs> and at this point, I can finally, um, I'll finally let you go and have Connor uh, run the Prezi that we presented actually in the Eastern Economic Association meeting very successfully um, last uh, month together. And uh, over to you, Connor. And uh, wait, wait, wait. I need to pass the ball. Wait. Uh, there we go. All has been passed. Maybe we should turn it. Now I need to share my screen. All right, so before I jump into exactly what gamification is, I want to take a brief look at using games in the classroom. I like to look at it as more of an active learning as opposed to the passive learning, being told what to learn. And a good anecdote I have for this is from a math class actually in Rollins College where casino games are used to teach problem statistics. I think this is really interesting because by playing through the game and then getting a debriefing afterward, you almost invent probability statistics to do the games. Much in the same way that you can say Isaac Newton invented calculus to do physics, you're playing an active role in creating what you're learning at the end. Likewise, when this game civilization is used, you almost create economics in order to go through this economic history and since they're interrelated, like in reality across multiple dimensions, this simulation-based rather than model-based 
is actually much better at communicating these complicated ideas. But that's still game as pedagogical tools. My preferred definition of gamification would be structuring the entire game, or rather the entire course as a game. By borrowing from the extremely successful parts of gaming that make it so addictive, you can actually make learning experiences much in the same way. So without further ado, gamification. I think one of the easiest and most effective ways to gamify a course in order to generate engagement is borrowed from a book called The Multiplayer Classroom, where you inform every incoming student that they have an F. Now, this may seem shocking, but any good student knows that rather than an unblemished, perfect grade at the beginning of the year, you're actually starting with a zero. Most students don't actually view the course like this since they get a bunch of review assignments at the beginning of the year, and this bolsters this tendency to view your grade as 100% rather than a 0%. Now, starting at a 0% rather than being met with dismay or disillusionment, I've seen firsthand that students actually react with determination. And this is because they can clearly see the linear progression from starting at a 0 or an F and progressing up through levels up until an A. Now, once again, this is very important and motivational because in a traditional roller coaster style classroom, you'll have a bunch of negative reinforcement with red X's and bad grades. And this creates cycles, I would say, of complacency and hard work, where students don't necessarily engage with the material the entire time if they're feeling ahead in the course. Or conversely, if they're feeling like they're behind in the course, they may put in a week of solid work and then go back to not engaging with the material. By structuring the course in this way, it actually creates a positively reinforced progression from the start of the year to the end of the year that students can understand much better. Now, within gamification, a big deal is made of the points, the levels, the badges, but these extrinsically motivating things are only half the story. For someone that's intrinsically motivated like myself, the fact that it quantifies this intrinsic motivation is actually one of the biggest motivating factors within the course. Now, what this means is, by having a progress bar like you see pictured, or having a leaderboard, you can actually see yourself matched up against the class and against how much time you have left in the year. And it's much easier to see your progression. I think in the future, having something like this to progress possibly from zero to a number like 10,000 hours which obviously Michael Gladwell has made very popular, students can actually see their progression from an amateur to an expert much more clearly. We'll look at the potentially negative aspect of the competitive atmosphere leaderboard fosters later, but for now let's focus on the positives. Now likewise, points, badges, levels, achievements, etc., all have a huge role to play in motivating students within the gamified course structure. They can both counteract the weaknesses and bolster the strengths of a given course. What I mean by this is, an award like the Going Transonic Award you see would be best for either review exercises or material that should be 100% understood. So rewarding students for quickly and effectively answering 10 questions correctly would create an atmosphere like this. On the other hand, in a more complicated economic class where, say, multiple perspectives need to be viewed and compared against each other. An award like my favorite, the Dr. Spock Award, for a highly logical paper, would be best because it naturally pushes students to pursue these things. Obviously, having a high degree of logical rigor within a paper is always a goal, but having a badge specifically designed for it has been shown, as we'll see later, to actually change students' behavior in order to actively pursue these badges. Now, likewise, pouring from the game mechanics can create this game mechanic zen that perfectly rides the line between too frustrating and difficult and too easy and boring. Now, I think this is even better achieved by using quests rather than assignments. Quests can be adapted without actually changing any of the core assignments, because just by making each assignment unlock the next assignment or quest, you can structure all your traditional assignments as the core quest within a gamified class and have students progress through it linearly. Still, the real great aspect of quests is that you can add side quests in order to generate more engagement when students don't necessarily want to deal with the topic at hand. 
One great example I can think of is if you're in a computer science class, having a high reward quest for personally developing your own app would be effective at having students engage with coding, but not necessarily keeping the same core assignments that they're exploring. Likewise, quests can be used to address weaknesses in the class, such as poor attendance or poor participation, by offering a much lower rewarding quest for coming to class and actually participating. Even though a syllabus might say that active participation is a part of the student's grade, by not explicitly seeing it throughout the year, students often forget or become disinterest, in, disinterested in participating. Now we can see that although it utilizes modern technology, things like immediate feedback, freedom, uncertainty, and a low risk creative environment are all things that the best traditional classrooms have embodied, such as the Socratic method. But recently, modern technology has made it much more easy to achieve. Now, looking at some of the studies that support this style of learning, there have been a few recently great neuroscience studies by Dr. Howard Jones at the University of Bristol that show that dopamine orients attention and enhances the making of connections between neurons, which is the brain basis for learning. Now, I'm sure most teachers were aware that an engaged student internalizes the information better, but having the empirical evidence to show that an interested student is an informed student helps support the idea that structuring the course as a game and making it engaging will actually have a better learning experience. Likewise, I found it particularly revealing that any reward, virtual or not, is rewarding, and that activation of dopamine peaks at the same level for the best available outcome in games. This means that with a gamified course structure, the virtual gold star worth 100 points will have the same level of dopamine activation as any real world reward that you could have been offered. In combination, I feel like these two studies are particularly revealing because it shows that by borrowing from the immensely successful gaming industry in order to generate a more addictive and neurologically stimulating learning experience, students will actually become better interested. Likewise, a degree of uncertainty is a major component of gamified courses because that reward I mentioned earlier, such as Dr. Spock, which may or may not be achieved, has been shown to be hugely rewarding in terms of dopamine. If the reward is guaranteed at 100 or has 0% chance of being rewarded, the level of dopamine activation it stays virtually baseline the entire time. On the other hand, when it hovered around 50%, that's when the dopamine activation peaked. This shows that having rewards that are built into the course that aren't necessarily taken for granted or too rare will create a much better learning experience. Now the question of whether or not these things work, I think was definitively proven on analysis of the Stack Overflow community. Yeah. It showed that users actually value badges and will modify their site activities in order to earn these badges. I like to refer to this phenomenon as directed behavioral momentum. Behavioral momentum means that once someone starts doing something, it's like a ball rolling down the hill and they will continue to do so. Now it's directed because by offering quests or rewards to incentivize students into certain behaviors, such as dealing with the material on a weekly basis rather than monthly, you can actually create an environment that pushes students into picking these things up into their routine but without actually having to force them into that engagement. Now, obviously, there are some drawbacks of gamification that need to be addressed moving forward. And one of the foremost ones that we'll see when we look into the learning management system currently being used is that it lacks the ability for users to collaborate. Now, obviously, this can be addressed technologically or through the addition of another website, but that multi-user learning experience is one thing that going forward would be a nice addition. Now, as mentioned earlier, for some individuals, a leaderboard actually fosters a negative experience for them because they can get intimidated by others that are progressing through the course quicker, more quickly. Now, going back to a multiplayer classroom, the book actually mentioned a great solution to this where you can create a quest or even just a reward that will reward if everybody in the classroom progresses past a certain level before a certain date. Now this is cool because it creates an environment where the class is against the course, 
rather than classmates competing against each other. Likewise, one of the drawbacks is technological inexperience within the course, which I think can actually be served by students helping students, whether through the use of an undergraduate TA or within the class creating a reward for helping another student get past a certain point. But I think this will be lessened once learning management systems are developed past the point of beta and are more seamless. Now, in terms of from a teacher's perspective, keeping a connection between the quest and the overall learning goals is very important because you don't want to allow too much freedom for students to explore side quests and earn experience and boost their grade to the point where they don't actually grapple with the core material. I think this is best achieved by making the core assignments within a class the main cornerstone of the class and then adding side quests in slowly, possibly with communication between the students so that you know that the objectives and topics that you want to cover will be covered. And now I think it's important to note that gamification is only a tool and that the old techniques of learning are actually being accomplished through modern technologies. Gamification needs to be deepened because material won't teach itself and you won't invent probability eloquently just by playing blackjack. Likewise, gamification is dependent on course goals and won't be a good one-size-fits-all for every course. More advanced courses might only be able to use some of the aspects of gamification, but I feel as though almost every classroom experience can benefit from some aspects. And I feel, in general, in education, we've relied too much and too heavily for too long on telling students how and what to think. And currently, we're in the stage and progressing through of showing them Finally, through the use of gamification and modern technology, we're getting to the point where we can actively involve students in their education and create a generation that's motivated towards understanding. And as Confucius said, this will be much better internalized. That's all for me. I'll pass back to Benjamin Valley. Perfect. Unmute unmute myself. Hopefully you hear me. Thank you very much, Connor. Um, so you've seen a lot of things there, and I'll kind of continue from where he left. Um, uh, first of all, since we've been talking about this, the gamification the game lab, you saw the, the bar, a couple of things there, I wanted to kind of just show it to you for a second. Uh, so for that purpose, I will attempt the following real quick, if I may. And yes, there we go. Boom. Right. That should be working, I think. So here's an example you, that you can't see. Now, that you have the link for 3dgamelab.com, and you can see they have little videos. They have, you know, cutesy stuff to introduce it. But this is how it looks on the inside. Um, and I was desperately looking for something like this, having read some of the literature in the summer. And I, I think it's the only one so far uh, that you can individually, in, in a very um, um, cheap way, as individual students can, uh, student, sorry, uh, teacher can just uh, buy a subscription to this um, uh, and get in on it right away and manage your courses. I have multiple courses, some of which I take myself, some of which I'm giving. Here's the one that I talked about the most, the civilization. They, um, this is, of course, somewhat more complex. The students only see the initial one, and they take that one, and then the other are more open. And these are quests, a whole bunch of them, watching documentaries, making commentary about them, uh, you know, reading texts, making commentaries about them. Here's uh, looking at the statistical uh, um, tool uh, by Hans Rosling um, and being able to, to look at a couple of clips and visit the site and mess with data and uh, read some sources, some links, and then submit a commentary, a written commentary. Um, again, I don't, we don't have time to deal with it too much. I think you can see some of it for yourself, and I'll be more than happy to share more information or to let you into one of my classes virtually, you know, as a, as a, as a fake student if you want to see some more things. Uh, but just so that you get a picture of how it looks. Oh, uh, I have zero XP and currently have a simple S because, well, I haven't done any homework in my own class. <laughs> um, of course, if I look at something else, such as the Academy, the gamified course that I took to learn how to operate this and get badges and stuff, 
And as you can see, I am, oh, there are announcements. Come on, come on shut down. I am a conqueror. You don't actually have to call it A, B, C, D, E, F. They don't. But anyway, this is just a quick glimpse at that. Uh, let's get back to, to this again. I'll be happy to share more. Uh, it's practical. I like to recommend them. And no, they're not saying anything. Um, I think it's a very nice, uh, and just like they're just saying that earlier, uh, they are responsive, they help you out, they add features, um, it's an exciting little company. Um, so how about here, the results of doing this for three terms in a row? First of all, a lot of the results are similar in terms of the enthusiasm, the things that Connor just explained, I think, no case point in and, uh, repeating. I like to reiterate clearly that students do overwhelmingly, the vast majority of them love it. And the reason, and they love it for the best reasons, not because it's uh, cheaply, not because it's easy, because of flexibility of time and space. They can do it at different times. They have a lot of control um, in different places, on a tablet even. It scales rather well. Um, uh, but most importantly, again, it's going to mention learning styles. It's actually really hard to accommodate different learning styles in traditional course. It's much easier here, and this is something definitely under development. The same material, uh, people can be viewing a document, they can be reading a doc, uh, um, text, an article, um, a, a documentary, um, and then they might want to write analytically, they might prepare to write um, creatively, they might prepare to deal with the issue through creating media themselves. Um, I use this in my propaganda class. Uh, so that they can analyze, they can go crawl on the internet, for example, and do a brief comparison, or they can write more traditional academic style, they can create their own propaganda. A lot of different options of dealing with the same material, and the option is there. You do not have to do them all. You can do a certain subset of them, um, or really uh, um, focus on your uh, uh, learning style strength. Uh, again, under development, but highly promising, I think. Students love the quick feedback, the specific feedback, like with the badges, one of the explaining. Um, the clarity, the fact that at the end of the semester, whatever grade is up there, just, you know, work harder. You know, put more work in and you can get to an A. Mismanage your time, uh, too bad for you. The weaker students are able to rather seamlessly just work harder and get a high grade. Um, and that, I think, is a, is a positive model in my view. Um, so, uh, the security we see here, you, you know about high risk, uh, examinations and how awful they are. This is the opposite, right? You, you, it's up to you. Um, so, so that you have a strong degree of certainty in your performance if you so choose. Um, okay. This was the one that really needs skipping. Um, you can tell because of the small font. Um, but I do want to just say that that uh, the whole gaming phenomenon is is is, uh, is huge and underreported. Uh, it, it is important in art. It's important in sciences. It's overwhelmingly humongous. People of all fields and all ages are deeply engaged in in computer gaming. And in many ways, I do think that uh, that the puzzle of uh, you know the information, the the technological revolution, the information revolution, uh, computers, microcomputers were even invented in the seventies already. It really happened in the past five years because the technology gets embedded into social relations and human experience, and that's where it matters. Even the steam engine took over a hundred years to have a real impact. And until very recently, and in the gaming-driven world of Web 2.0 and beyond, Game 3.0 is really when when all computers will be gaming machines. Um, and we're stuck in what I like to think of as a 19th century clerical metaphor, the desktop. It's a very inefficient it's technology used to imitate an old model. It hasn't broken loose of its uh, sectors, right, uh, yet. Um, so here, uh, i got to stop here. I'd be more than happy to go into more details and share our paper draft. Uh, so how about uh, poll number two, uh, before we get into the political economy? Here it is. <laughs> um, and I'll continue talking right into it. It's time, as I didn't. To go on for three hours. Um, okay, it's been hard without dedicated institutional support. And some of the people listening I know already uh, will be the ones who will make my life much easier in the near future. So thank you. I've been much in isolation without this. 
uh, not having tech support. You see, I mean, our tech support people are dedicated to Blackboard or Canvas or whatever it is most people are using, and I can't send them to help install Civ on people's computers. Uh, so I have to do it myself, and tech support is very complicated. Um, I want to point out the fact that a lot of people who are not big geeks uh, somehow think that kids are very tech literate, and that's not always the case. You know, just because they can check their Facebook status in class while you're giving the lecture does not mean that they're tech literate. Um, so I've had a lot of problems with students feeling very frustrated with running very basic uh, technology and had to help them. Um, but I think it's worthwhile because it really provides practical job skills, yes? Um, sorry. Um, so, so that's kind of a bad thing that can be turned, to, turned good out of it. Uh, but there are solutions. Uh, definitely, like Connor was mentioning, undergraduate CAs and in the Eastern Constitution, we did discuss this and heard a presentation in Buffalo State um, that, that uh, uses undergrad CAs, and we think that undergrad CAs would be actually very effective here without the typical shortcomings of undergraduate CAs. Uh, be very helpful when we look into that. Um, there's elements of collaboration, even like in the guild, guilds and games, where there's a lot of a culture of helping each other. Um, and even give quests for it, and that's also in the works right now with quests in which uh, not only the person who seeks help gets, gets credit for seeking help, and the person who provides the help gets uh, more credit. Uh, so it fosters this collaborative behavior, which is a major element of game culture uh, that makes it happy. Um, now, uh, and then there's this, this active participation, is a nice way of calling it, or just me yelling at them, figure it out, uh, which is really kind of important too. Um, and working with students with co-researchers, as you see, is a very nice thing, too, um, and I'm enjoying very much. Now, there is this element of, you know, stay calm and you have control. You, know? you have to be experimental. In fact, you know, it's not a very traditional way of doing things, you know, submitting everything, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted to academic affairs committee, and Rollins is quite good at letting us go crazy if we're willing to do so. So it's experimental, evolutionary, even an archistic pedagogical ethos. Oh um, kind of embrace it. I like it. Um, try it, change it, tweak it, be honest with the students that this is a data and you're trying your best and you want their feedback and we're all in this together. Um, doing a grading structure that's so fundamentally different than the one that most courses surrounding you are using is also problematic. It requires some attention to, to persuading the students that you're on their side, that they really mean it, that you're going to get the grade based on their points, and that you're not going to switch and base them at the end. Uh, requires some attention. Um, and finally, the fact that you being a little bit more flexible tends to mean that you get pushed down to the bottom of the to-do list and other, stu other professors that are more, um, you know, uh, what's the polite way, uh, <laughs> you know, hard something, I suppose, right? Uh, the tough, tough, there we are, um, tend to be taken care of. The students take care of their assignments first. So there's a bit of a problem there. You know, I got uh, issues with attendance because I'm flexible. Um, so I give them positive points for attendance. And it's working, I think. Tweaking, tweaking. Um, the popularity might pull from other courses. This might cause a certain, um, certain disbalance. Um, if popularity is a good thing, generally, but it could be a problem. And I think a lot of uh, advantage also can happen if more people are doing it with some economies of scale, where we can centralize the gaming aspect and then serve multiple classes, especially other professors who don't want to do the gamification but might want to benefit from it. Now, there's a political element, right? The battle lines are drawn, right? There's a lot of bad blood in many, if not most, institutions today. And I really want to just get to this real quick because I think it's technology education is somewhat caught in between. On the one hand, you have the administrator rhetoric, right? Books and blended and flips and people think that they're gimmicky and PR driven and perhaps to some extent they are. Some people are paranoid and perhaps to some extent they're correct that this is really just a ploy and my suspicious question in the poll that um, that uh, this is just a way to, you know, get rid of us and, and put adjuncts and boot stamps to provide our distance <laughs> learned courses. Um, as I mentioned before, I think unification would actually be a, a resistance to that. And on the other hand, we let, let us give credit where credit or discredit where credit is due. The faculty intransigence is also real, and there's some degree of Luddism maybe, and six in the mud or whatever we want to call it. Um, well, I think the onus is as usual on those who are advocate something new, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So I think the resistance of many faculty to this is understandable, but I think uh, a good dialogue can go a long way of helping. Yeah. So I admit and accept most distance learning is awful. I think gamification can help make it better, maybe even good. 
many words on development of higher education are very true. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a major uh, a paranoid um, uh, person in this domain, and I do think that the sharp decline in the faculty is a critically bad development. Again, I think the technology in this case does not necessarily have to cause problems. Uh, there's problems of the ownership of the curriculum. Absolutely there is. Just like Web 2.0, right? I post all my pearls of wisdom to Facebook and no, and it's uh, Zuckerman that gets rich off of it, right? Uh, same thing here. So who owns the content? And um, again, I think gamification allows us to be essential throughout the process as opposed to other more passive technological education tools. Um, there's a problem with monopolistic power. And here, you know, the MOOCs uh, that I, I hate, <laughs> um, as opposed to more interesting uh, developments that I learned on Nightly and the FemTechNet um, seminar about distributed open collaborative courses, if you will. It's not a single professor at Harvard that distributes wisdom to uh, millions of people around the world, but millions of teachers around the world that are channeling their knowledge to millions of students around the world. So it's non-monopolistic as an economist and sense that that sort of thing. And, um, but, you know, we definitely have to um, look for um, a, a means to keep teachers in control of teaching. It's a tech culture ethos in many ways, maybe even a gamers ethos. Um, you know, winter is coming faster than you think. Uh, I am worried about a lot of developments in higher education, uh, let alone K-12. Uh, I think gamification in particular is labor enhancing and not labor replacing, unlike traditional learning um, distance learning, unlike MOOCs, and even blended learning model, um, I'm semi, uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about them, I think in some ways they're not going far enough, and in so doing, they don't um, have that old school pedagogical foundation that I think education can revive, maintain, etc. And finally, you know, we better grab the bull by the horns, or it will grab us by the Leap. Thank you very much. And uh, we made it. Three minutes. Questions. I think maybe even I should. Um, give uh, yeah, I think we um, I have just a couple of minutes, and I'm just going to go to the the most recent one. Um, Vayner Bailey said, uh, "I remember someone in higher ed saying that there were no extra credit assignments. It would be nice if Vinny or Connor could address this in terms of the side quest." Shall I? Uh, oh yeah, I, don't, I can talk, right? I forgot, just control. Yeah, got excited. And absolutely, well, just like games, there are multiple parallel assignments. Quests are really assignments, right? Some of them would require a previous one uh, and then a follow-up assignment, so that would be called a quest chain, uh, that you can't do one before you finish the other. Um, so it's all extra credit, if you will. You are uh, incentivizing students positively. Um, so I give extra points for something I really want to make sure they all do. I mean, I could make it required, but it's somewhat against the ethos. So it's all with positive reinforcement. If I sufficiently incentivize it, and again, guide them, do this, guys, uh, then they do. And there's a degree of that letting go of freedom. If somebody really chooses to avoid that important um, assignment and compensating by taking a, doing a whole bunch of other ones, I can live with that. Um, that's it. It's, it's, you know, I'm tweaking. I have a quite, rather complex spreadsheet, uh, tweaking the different um, uh, rewards of different quests in order to try and behaviorally uh, influence them to do so. Um, in the senior seminar, it's quite rigid. So that's my experiment in taking a course that is really has to remain pretty straightforward. They have to go through the stages of reading, analyzing, researching a paper in multiple stages along very traditional lines of a research-based uh, uh, course, but just the, in, the, the, the LMS and, um, and the way in which it's structured. So it's all, they're, 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 not, they're not really options. Options is like you're giving up points, you're not going to get an A. That's your option. <laughs> in that course, the most traditional of my game of life course. So. Well, that that brings us to the top of the hour, and uh, we welcome uh, the Nightly Network to uh, either send us questions or send Benny questions. And um, on behalf of, of everyone participating today, I want to thank Benny and Connor uh, for 
uh, sharing your experiences with Nightly Shared Academics. And I want to thank those of you who participated today because uh, Nightly Shared Academics is about participation and uh, questions and comments and making connections across all of our institutions to advance liberal education. So thank you very much. I hope you all will uh, uh, complete our short survey. It's only seven questions. I've pasted it into chat and we'll send you a link uh, in the follow-up email as well with all the resources and the video and um, please do let us know um, what you're interested in learning about next. So thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very, very much.